of Grant Talks Funny Bits, where we talk to expert hypnotists every single week. And we've had some amazing guests on that talk about everything and anything. Um, tonight's guest is very much a specialist in his field, um, a world-renowned expert in the business of show business and in the business of hypnosis. Um, and that's a lot of things that a lot of us worry about. We, we spend all our money on this training. We, we try and do the best that we can, but we don't want to kind of be too business-like. Um, this guy took show business, took stage hypnosis, and is now a world expert in the marketing and the business side of hypnosis. He doesn't really need much of an introduction, although he is the most purple hypnotist. And it pains me to say this. He is the most purple hypnotist in the world. Uh, so please... Uh, Bang your keyboards, make some noise for the one, the only, Mr. Jason Burnett. He'll appear there, I think. No, he'll appear there. There right he is. Here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, Grant, I keep doing the same thing as I do workshops from here now. And the game, I'm like, oh, yeah, this image over here. No, no, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's like working with a client. I eventually had to learn to no longer say as I reach over and pick up your right hand. Yes. Because it was my right, but it was their left. <laughs> yeah. As we pick up that hand, or nowadays that I do everything online, just let a hand lift up. <laughs> yes, yeah, that one. Any hand. <laughs> <laughs> Less it's, is more. I think it's one of the positives that's come from uh, coronavirus, if it, you could say it's a positive. A lot of stuff was going online anyway. A lot of people were doing, starting to push towards virtuals. I know you were a big pioneer of that in the beginning. Um, and I think coronavirus has just took that. And, you know, I think we're five to 10 years ahead of what we should have been about kind of moving our worlds online. Um, well, it's what happened, and I'd, I'd point to a quick resource here on this, uh, which is, what did we make it? It's worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash now online. And don't put any spaces in that. Just cram the two words now online together. That the story was... Uh, you'll love the timing of this one because like you do this program and it goes out live. Um, we record the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast like yeah. once a month and then they release on schedule. So there's the either Wednesday or Thursday that the kids were sent home from school and they didn't go back for a year and a half. Uh, Grant, we had an episode all about how to do interactive group sessions. <laughs> <laughs> drive attention to your hypnosis business ready to launch on that Thursday. And it's like the one time ever that I wow. message, I have editors who help produce it. I'm like, don't put that out. They're like, it's already sketched. I'm like, delete it. <laughs> yeah. This is not the episode we put out today. Um, yeah. And drove to the office at the time and recorded a new one all about, here's how you bring your business online. And like the next really five weeks was for the first time ever putting out two episodes a week with other people who there was a dialogue of, we can't do this. And there's some of us off to the side are going, Hey guys, we've, we've already been doing this. Yeah. Here's, here's how. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. sharing the methods of how to the, the process really becomes the same with the right strategies. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I, I think, especially for the hypnotherapists, I, I think it's, it's a great place for clients because the world is suddenly completely connected to where you are. And the client can access that therapy, access that coaching instantly where they are, if you know. I mean, you don't you don't have that barrier of of getting in the car and driving to that person's office for the appointment, all those little things that your unconscious can put in your way to to create that barrier. That's all gone now. It's just a case of having some earphones and a laptop and you you're good to go as such. Well, I chair, here's the exact language. This this replays on multiple places, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So here's the part that a lot of people are going to like, oh, let me rewind back and listen to this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you say something enough, it just locks into the brain and you go, that's what we say for this. And this is what it became over time that uh, it turns out that doing hypnosis online can be just as effective as in person, if not even more effective for three simple reasons. First of all, once the hypnosis begins, you close your eyes and you listen to me. So if that's what's going on in the space, why do you need to be in the same room? It's the yeah. same process at that point. Second of all, uh, and credit to Howard Cooper over where you live for this little nugget, uh, it turns out that, you know, in respect to the offices that I'd opened up over the years, the change never occurred in the room. No, the change occurred in your head. Yeah. So you know what, wherever you've got your head, 
you can do the work. The third one is the reason why even back to like 2010 and 2011, before the technology was even ready for online work, I was doing sessions with people like on Skype and dealing with call drops back then. It's better now. Yeah. Um, yet you weren't smoking a pack and a half a day in my office. You didn't have a fear of public speaking in my office. You weren't emotionally eating in my office. So like you said, you'd have to drive to then forgive the phrase, but role play the problem, pretend yeah. the issue when even better, even if we were meeting in person at the time, let's do at least one of the sessions in the environment where you want to notice the change because yeah. this way we can get the instant gratification of it. So if it's an issue with speaking at work, Hey, can you book the conference room, bring a laptop in and all of a sudden, it was why even for local clients and where I used to live up around the D.C. area, Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, traffic was horrible. <laughs> and even the, 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 the sort of icing on the cake was the Saturday before everything stopped back in March 2020 uh, was I get tapped on the shoulder at a restaurant at a shopping mall and he's smiling and he goes, I don't think you remember me. And I called him by his name nice. and he was a client who I'd been seeing and we had never met in person. Wow. Yeah. And there's something profound about that. Yeah. Uh, a couple of comments as well. Uh, talk about highbrow and in-depth hypnosis comments. Um, uh, they're asking you about your tan. <laughs> about my what? Uh, about your tan. Uh, Richard Cole said, is that a tan on Jason? Uh, and uh, Paul Ramsey says, that's because uh, somebody's moved to Florida uh, and it wasn't Richard, and it wasn't you or me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm seeing the comment here. Where was this? Oh, I lost it. Someone was, uh, it was brilliant. And this definitely shows me a little bit at a time. Well, that was a great moment. Oh, it was about Natasha and meatloaf. Uh, and I was reading the wrong meatloaf. Oh, oh it's yes. the right meatloaf. Yes, yeah. that was it. A cooking program. There you go. I read about a cooking blog that uh, had how to roast meatloaf scheduled to go out the day meatloaf died. Oh, yeah. oh, there we go. That's yeah. got context now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that a tan on Jason? No, I am just as pale now. Um, it's not that cold here today, and everyone freaks out and puts on sweaters. So yes, and and what is the temperature there today? Just for for the English people and the Canadians watching, what's I've got the, the math temperature? figured out already because I'm polite that way. I, I one time, well, I'm sure we're going to talk stage hypnosis. I did a program. This is my way of coming back to your question here in a moment. I did a program for a summer camp. <clears throat> And the staff was like 80% international and like 20%, you know, US. And the classic routine of it's getting colder and colder. And I'm there going, wait a minute, I've always done this in Fahrenheit. Yeah. As it's dropping down to 66 degrees, down to 18 degrees Celsius, it's getting colder and colder as it drops down to 32, zero degrees Celsius. I'm like, I kept everybody. It worked. So yes, it is uh, 65 right now. So roughly um, 18 Oh, Celsius. Oh, which um, again, that's oh, springtime. Yeah. People forget <laughs> put mittens on for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that shorts and t-shirt weather here. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, talk us about your, your your kind of uh, you know your first experience with stage hypnosis. I know in the states you guys are more exposed to it from an earlier age. If exposed is the right word, um, it's more acceptable in the high schools over there. Tell us about the first show you saw. I'm now cautious that's a story of exposure and involves college, um, <laughs> yeah. but you can't find those photos on the web. So I guess exactly. we're all right. So I had, let's rewind back even further. I had a hobby of doing close up sleight of hand magic as a teenager. And I turned out to be pretty decent at it and like went to magic conventions, which that is, there's no cooler sentence than that one. I know. And going to magic conventions and competing and winning. Uh, and yet, even though, not to pat on the back, I was quite good at it. There was this frustration as to if I could really do magic, if someone could really make magic happen, why would they carry around a pack of cards? Yeah. Yeah. So there was like too much exposition. It was um, in the magic world. It's the, and here I have syndrome and here I have an ordinary box. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would ultimate magic trick? You suddenly go, I'm hungry. And I go, Le Mignon. Uh, so <laughs> there was this frustration and I saw that interest kind of fading away and perfect timing. I'm in uh, college and it's the welcome week. And here comes a hypnotist who does a program. And some of you might know of Tom DeLuca. It was Tom. 
And for the first time ever, here was no props, mm. um, no tricks, um, and it was all communication. And you saw everything, and clearly there had to have been a secret in terms of how it worked, yet it was all transparent to the audience. And I went, yeah. I want to learn that. Yeah, uh, I did make the happy mistake of buying the wrong books first. So <laughs> the books were all like, you know, Gil Boyne and, um, you know, Virginia Satir, Melton Erickson. They had hypnosis on the title, but yeah. not what I was looking for. And it was this split focus of this isn't what I want. Oh, interesting. And kept reading through like the Dave Ellman stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, there, there's an anecdote inside of this which offends some hypnotist, which makes it even better, uh, <laughs> which is the hypnotist, Tom, who did the show. I was a theater major at the time. And shortly after university, I worked in professional theater, more on the backstage side of things as management. And Tom did a great job of picking his volunteers randomly from the audience. And the show was incredible for me because turns out those were mostly my friends who were also fellow, fellow theater majors. So this created this unfortunate split reality of part of the audience is now going, these are actors. Yeah. This isn't real. And I'm watching. They hate that I tell the story. My friends are not this good of actors. Wow, they're really genuine on stage. This is amazing. I have to learn this. Yeah. None of them are actors to this day. So I stand by the story. But it's this <laughs> moment of getting that proof that, okay, there's something to this. I need to learn more. And you know, the rest of the story is kind of following that same route of, I did a ton of self-study, a ton of learn as much as I could on my own, asking questions, um, going to trainings. And it was always, even at times where I knew that, you know, I, the fun moment of, you know, Sean Michael Andrews, I did a certification event with him at one point. And day one is he goes, we're going to watch some videos on hypnosis so you can see what it looks like to see the process play out. And then he shows my video clip from the local news station. It was a fun dynamic of people going, why are you taking this? I'm like, because he does something interesting and I want to learn what he does. Mm. So you know, we were chatting before we hopped on here about just a desire for ongoing learning and improvement. Yeah. Um, so yeah, from getting into the stage hypnosis and in some way by learning the wrong part first to kind of frame the story. What really came about though was I was never the comedy club show. I was never the dirty Christmas show for the yep. car club, for the car dealership. It was always the stage hypnotist with the hypnotherapist heart. Yeah. Is I think what describes it. What's going on at the school? What's going on in the company? Yeah. How can I use this humorous moment to then illustrate a point? So and stage, I think, stage hypnosis lends itself wonderfully yeah. to customization, experience, here's what this means, teaching point. Yeah. And, that and I, think that's where, I think that's where stage hypnosis is, is going. I think, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was about let's make people do ridiculous things that are embarrassing. Let's do this. Let's be a bit more adult. Now, I think audiences have matured so much more uh, you know the fascination with Darren Brown and mentalism audiences are fascinated by the psychology of hypnosis so I do think I do think audiences love that more and going back to the point you said about that kind of constantly learning and developing I think the problem or the challenges that most stage hypnotists face in my opinion is they they have their skills from their life that they start with they, they take a course, they watch some YouTube videos, they read some books, they learn stage hypnosis. They get fairly good at stage hypnosis. And then that's when they stop learning. They kind of go, well, I've read all the books, I've seen all the stuff, I know how to hypnotize people, and they stop there. Whereas, you know, you're always either speaking at a conference, you're at some marketing, you know, retreat somewhere, you're constantly developing yourself which in turn feeds into your hypnosis. What are your thoughts? How, what do you think about the about continuing to go into the different avenues, the marketing, the business side of it? Yeah, well, it's the deeper you get into all of it, the more you begin to realize it's the same conversation everywhere. So whether it's stage hypnosis, whether it's hypnotherapy, working with clients for change, whether it's even a sales transaction, it's about calibrating to someone else 
taking note of what their desires, what their goals are, and helping them move towards that desired intent, which is even inside, yes, of stage hypnosis, where the people who are volunteering. Um, I got a little, here's the negative, I got a little frustrated back around 2012, 2013, when I would go to a hypnosis conference and someone was teaching a business strategy that they had not yet done themselves. Yeah. And that's the blind leading the blind. And that's just, that's just dangerous. Yeah. So that's where I went. Okay. So I can create greater impact. I can create more benefit in people's lives by promoting what I do better. And I'll give you the quote that kind of illustrates this and to give some credit where it's due. This is my quote that, is taking two other people in the business world, Jay Abraham and Frank Kern, and taking two of the quotes of theirs and just mushing them together. So let me give credit, even though it's my line now, that the quality and the quantity of the impact you create in people's lives is directly proportionate to the quality and the quantity of the content and the invites, let's say offers, that you put out to the world. Nice. So it was the ability to look at what are people doing in other industries that let's just call it out are thinking much bigger. They're not just thinking about the next show. They're not just thinking about how do I move my client session rate from 150 to 175. Here are the people that were creating significant impact around the world. And as I was sat in the room in the early days of doing this, it was that discovery of they're speaking in hypnotic language patterns and they don't yeah. realize it. Yeah. Yeah. And how, again, from curious shopper to satisfied buyer is almost identical to stuck in the problem to now living in the solution. Yep. So I actually, uh, as part of the audience here, I know is about entertainment. It was an interview with George Carlin that inspired a lot of this thinking that he didn't just do the big comedy special here in the States on HBO every single year for a while. Um, because they paid him a lot of money. I'm sure that did have something to do with it. But from a bit of an artistic challenge, comedy is different than music. If you go see a band, um, there's Universal Studios five minutes from my home, and the band Styx is going to be there next week. If you see them and they don't do Come Sail Away, you're going to be very angry. Yeah. Um, People have already been talking Meatloaf. This is where clearly Meatloaf was the smartest musician ever. His concert used to be Bad Out of Hell 1, Bad Out of Hell 2, Bad Out of Hell 3 <laughs> in order. Yeah. He just performed the albums. So with uh, music, they want to hear the stuff that they already know. With comedy, if they've already heard it, they go, I know that, Joe. There's a yeah. few things that transcend that. Like the modern version is uh, Jim Gaffigan. Uh, brilliantly comes out in the encore and does the hot pockets routine because that's why you went. But it was when George Carlin said, I produce the special because then I can't tour with that act. And it forces me to keep writing. It forces me to stay sharp. Yep. And it forces me to keep working at getting better at what I do. Yeah. And I heard that. And the, the modification is, um, teaching at times exactly what's working right now in my business. And there's complete safety of, you know, peeling back the curtain and saying, look, here's the step-by-step -step campaign. Those of you in the program, here's the transcription. There's the slides, use it. And it's because you can't do it the exact way that I do it because you shouldn't. Yeah. You need to make it your own, but it's, it, so one part of that is this challenge of let's create bigger impact than what some of us are thinking. I think across the board, most of this industry is thinking way too small. Yeah. But at the same time, how do we keep it fresh for ourselves and keep leveling up that, you know, mindset in terms of what we can create? Yeah. And it's, it is about that kind of collective. Uh, I know Paul Ramsey last week was kind of talking about that that stage hypnotist mastermind where, you know, rather than everyone fighting for the, the next gig, if people actually came together and worked together, it is about investing in the, the coaching programs. It's about investing in the mindset side of things as well. Um, yeah. Sorry. A quick question from Colin Chapman, uh, who says uh, stage hypnosis question. Do you feel stage hypnotists should use more direct suggestions or more Ericksonian approach? Uh, based on the style of the hypnotist. Colin and I have the worst inside joke ever, and I should censor myself 
You don't have to censor anything on here. There was a uh, this one I will because it's too long of a story, and I'm trying to hashtag Colin suggests. Let's just go with that for right now. So here's my thought on this, and I love this question. Um, should they use more direct suggestions, more Ericksonian approach? What's the style? My real answer comes around to. I worked professional theater for a while and you learn so much more about direction sitting behind the folding table, watching it being done badly. Mm, mm. And uh, sorry, let me characterize most stage hypnosis I've ever seen. In a moment, I'm going to play this song. Everybody's going to get up and dance. The person I'm tapping on the shoulder right now, you're going to be a platypus. The person I'm tapping on the shoulder right now, you're going to make fun of me. It's And it's all the same tone. Yeah. Go to any concert. And Here's the ballad. Here's the, uh, I always talk Willie Nelson when I have to talk about this because of all people, he came out, he gave the audience what they wanted right away, opening song on the road again. I don't follow any country music other than Willie. Um, then he does Rainbow Connection from the Muppet movie. And like the man has now regressed the entire audience back to children yeah. and there's people crying. Yeah. Um, then he had a duet with, to all, uh, Julio Iglesias to all the girls I loved before, but Willie does both parts and it's a freaking comedy routine now. So think about a little bit less as the practitioner, direct versus indirect. And I'd say think instead in terms of texture. So your show is not the same thing the entire way through. Mm. Because sometimes we can do the direct suggestion of, in a moment, something interesting is going to happen. The moment you open your eyes, you're going to see everybody go back to the audience. And that's when you're going to realize your body's become stuck to that chair. You're going to think it's the funniest thing ever because it's your job to get my attention to fix that weird sticky chair. That's one-to-one -one that's direct Yeah. versus a little quieter of a moment. Uh, because folks in the audience, in a moment, something interesting is going to happen. I'm going to just count from one to three. Some music's going to begin to play. And as long as that music's playing everything about me has disappeared. My clothing, my skin, my microphone, everything just completely. And clearly that's now indirect suggestion because I'm yeah. saying it to the audience, but they're hearing it. So I, I, I give it more, um, let's pull back for a moment and let's squash one of the classic hypnotic statements. No, all hypnosis is not self-hypnosis. <laughs> yeah. Wait for the modification. All hypnosis becomes self-hypnosis eventually. So there clearly is a mode that begins with practitioner, operator, subject, practitioner, client, however you want to label it. But there clearly is a moment where we are the mechanic directing a process. And that's how we blend that Elman Ericksonian style by beginning as the mechanic. So we know we've actually got the person where we want. Yeah. And then it becomes more artistic. You want to yeah. see the measure of a good stage hypnosis show. Look for the places of intentionally vague suggestions. Mm. In a moment, it's going to be really, really hot. Notice I'm not trying the math here. It's going to be really hot. You're going to fan yourself with both of your hands. Fan yourself with the other hands. That's right. Wave your clothes. And it's basically Simon Says. Yeah. And it's a bit of a leap to go. It's getting hotter and hotter out here. You're in a public place with families around. You got to keep those clothes on, and you've got to find whatever creative way works to keep yourself cool. And you shut up. Not you, Grant. You can keep talking. <laughs> you let this magical moment begin to yeah. develop. Which, yes, here's the person who suddenly takes off a shoe and is using it like a fan. Yeah. And you, let's call it out, get all the credit for that funny moment. But all you suggested was find a creative way to keep yourself cool. Yeah. So it's the real answer to that, I'd say, is not so much one style versus the other. I, I'd go back to, this is as deep cut as I can go. There's a book called The Trick Brain by Daryl Fitzke. I know, right? And it's a book that was written for magicians, I believe in the 1920s. And that was the uh, era of the box jumper. Magicians had the same problem. They'd wheel out the box, show it's empty, close up the doors, spin it around, girl jumps out. Yeah. Music change, wheel out the next box, show it's empty, spin it around, <laughs> open it up, girl jumps, the box jumpers. So this book had been referenced over the years by people like David Copperfield to say, there's a chapter in the book that breaks down 
all the different magical occurrences. Something can float, something can levitate, something can fly, something can be suspended. These are four different things. Something can disappear, something can appear, something can transform. And I encourage this kind of thinking, even, even in the change process, mm -hmm. that if everything has been the direct suggestion, what have I not done yet? I can apply to hypnotic phenomenon and attach that to the change. Yeah. I can make use of metaphor. Let's call that indirect. Um, I'm always cautious. Let's throw some credit where it's due. Erickson did a lot of phenomenal stuff. Uh, Virginia Satir uh, is someone that I think a lot of this industry needs to study more. Mm. That linguistics, the bringing someone into a slightly provocative situation to throw the issue slightly off and then facilitate a change. Uh, so this Fitzky reference really comes around to look for texture and make sure not every routine is this song plays get up and dance this song plays get up and dance and even yeah. sometimes it's directed to the audience sometimes it's directed to one person sometimes and you get the most magical response of um i did a thing one time which was and i did this in schools just to watch the administrators cringe <laughs> um Classic routine, you know, Martian visitors, translators, and so forth. And uh, it was in the post-hypnotics. Person I'm tapping on the shoulder in a moment. Uh, whenever I say my name, I have to apologize in advance, but I have said something tonight that really offended you. And whenever I say my name, Jason Lynette, uh, you're going to stand up and you're going to start to yell the meanest, cruelest things you possibly can. <laughs> the most insulting things. And I'm watching the administrators like, yeah. Only thing is, you're still that Martian visitor, and we're not going to understand a word that you're saying. Yeah. Which, yeah. texture, get the laugh from the suggestion, Yeah, and then get the bigger laugh when the person follows through. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a great suggestion. And like you said, that dropping in at the end there, delivering that punchline to the suggestion is what kind of gives the... And, and, the, and, and the indirect nature is I, I'm, I could have been interacting with someone, and this is happening behind me, and you know what's funny? Yeah, um, he can now speak in English, except now his uh, tongue stuck, stuck to the roof of his mouth. Yeah. Cool. Anyway, so, <laughs> and it's just the quick throwaway, which let's give the hypnotherapy application of this. Describe, thank you, Jess Marion, for this one. Uh, have her on this at some point. She's amazing. Describing the technique is doing the technique. Yes. So in the process today, it's as if these two parts of you are working in opposition. We're going to do something to bring those two parts together. Yep. But rather than two things fighting, instead it's one thing working in your best interest. Yeah. Sound good? <laughs> and when you get that checkpoint, yeah, it's like, good. That's a hypnotic contract. They've already verified that's going to help them. Yeah. So yeah. you see, again, it's the same conversation no matter where we are in that journey. And I think kind of how you were describing it then about that, you're right about texture. There's so many hypnotists that do just bark and bark and bark uh, because they think they've got to give off power and authority. Whereas by bringing it down a couple of degrees and using your tonality, it kind of, it brings the audience in as well. And I think that shows more power by its subtleness. Uh, well, it's, so it's not what we say, it's how we say it. And even for the practitioner working with a client for change, it's how can we paint with that texture? I did make the joke earlier of now you're a platypus. You did say the shows are just bark after bark. If someone out there does a show where you just turn everybody into platypi <laughs> for an hour and a half, I will buy the first ticket. Damn it. Yeah. I'm in. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, uh, Colin Chapman mentioned earlier about writing new material as well. Um, I I did a thing years ago. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I blame Paul Ramsey for this. Actually. Really? You're teaching it here. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I blame Paul Ramsey. I, I, I saw Paul, when, we, when we met in Vegas, Paul Ramsey would talked about his remotes for his mind game show where he gave the audience oh, yeah. the option to choose the things. And I thought, how can I do that? And at the time, I was doing a holiday park every week. So it was a good gig for me. So what I did is I thought, well, they've got the big projector. What I'll do is I'll put it out on Twitter. So, you know, find me on Twitter. You remember that old social media platform that people used to go on? Find me on Twitter and then tweet suggestions during the show. And that's what we'll do during the show. And I thought, what a great way of making me think on my feet and making the show completely interactive. First week, it worked marvelously. 
the second week word had got out and the problem with twitter is anybody can tweet anything yeah and it doesn't get censored and yeah. at a very family friendly holiday park that was not the wisest thing to do uh, i think we ended up having to unplug the projector uh, so that that was never be done again although there's something there's something inside of that and this is a story this is an insight that sometimes divides an audience um i had this moment of i i read uh, anthony jack when reality is plastic like a long time ago then mm. reread it again this is a fun story for someone hosting a radio program online radio remember that radio. Um, <laughs> i i was having anthony on the podcast i'm like oh he's got a audio version of his book let me listen to it before we record except time crunch i listened to it at two times the speed and so for like the first five minutes of that recording i'm like is what the heck is going on this is just dra oh, i'm used to fast anthony that's what it is um <laughs> i had this moment of my man reading that book where he goes, sometimes I will reach over and pick up a client's hand and just have them kind of go to a moment of catalepsy or just let it float because then it becomes quote, a leverage point. Yeah. And then I have to figure out something to do with it. Yeah. I heard Scott Sandland at one point talk about, I had this idea of a metaphor, a story that I could tell, and I thought it would be universal that I could use it for any issue. And so I gave myself a challenge that with every first session with every new client that month, I had to tell the story and I had to find a way to make it work. Nice. And I'll say consistently, the more effective the practitioner that I know, the more willing they are to put themselves, and it may not be to that degree, and it's going to be the need to find places to challenge themselves, yeah. to think on the fly. It's where the foundation of everything that I now do, whether it's teaching business to hypnotists, teaching business to higher level coaches and course creators, or even the hypnotic change process, the quality of the process you create is directly proportionate to the quality of the questions that you ask. And one of the, if I can encapsulate everything I've done differently with clients in the last couple of years, okay, so you've come here for fill in the blank. Do you mind if I ask a bit of an odd question? That's clearly going to be our focus today. Let's use smoking. Though, what happens for you differently when like this is the story five years out, the smoking's five years in the past? Basically, what I'm getting at is what's on the other side of this? Hmm. So up until now, the smoking has been this big thing in front of you. What happens when we just shrink it down so small that it's just the first step of a much bigger journey? And whatever answer you get usually can be met with the, that's really what we're here today to do, isn't it? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I, I had a student one time who had come in from a more scripted approach of things. And the line on the phone call before they signed up for the event was, yeah, but I just really hate it when they come in and like what I've prepared isn't a match for them. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's one day that defines my approach and it was this one day um right before we had kids and this marathon schedule of a day seven people one after the other and every one of them was quitting smoking and not for the sake of novelty there was no session that was similar in style to the others hmm. um one this is a fun one um your opinions may vary <laughs> What's your motivation to quit smoking? My husband says I need to. Yeah. Usually a red flag. Um, yeah. What about that is important to you? Was the question I asked. Well, in my Muslim faith, I need to honor and respect the wishes of my husband. Yeah. Oh, now it's a different story. Yeah. It may not be your model of the world, but for her place and her religion, it was. I did have to ask a follow up question of does he know you're here? He need not concern himself with how I've quit. All that matters <laughs> is I'm stopping the day. Can I pay cash at the end of this? Yes, you nice. can. The last appointment grant um, was like bread and butter standard session up until one moment where suddenly he leans in and launches into this conspiracy theory rant about how it's the same people funding the cigarettes that are funding the pharmaceuticals and they're going to make money off of you no matter how they're trying yeah. to help you out and all this. And like, I did the entire session off of this premise that him throwing them away was sticking his middle finger up at society and celebrating his, I've never done that session again. 
So yeah. the willingness to the willingness to get yourself into a scenario where you force yourself to figure something out. Yeah. Uh, I heard for years on the hypnotherapy side that, oh yeah, hypnotic phenomenon, like getting into an arm lock and stuff. That's a stage hypnosis thing that has no fit. Even right out of some of the recordings of Elman, that's something for the stage. It's not meant for the therapy. And I went, well, how can it become that? Hmm. And to achieve that arm lock moment, and here's indirect suggestion for you, Colin, um, and take this moment now and decide for yourself exactly what it means to break free of this issue once and for all. And you know what? Once you've done that for yourself, that's when that arm will begin to lower down slowly. That's right. So all of a sudden now, it's no longer the stunt. Yeah. It's instead motivated in the process. So again, get yourself in scenarios. Uh, I used to have like, I haven't done stage hypnosis to be transparent here since 2017. I retired myself from it. Um, I used to do a program that was like 80% entertainment, 20% message. What I focus on these days is I still do a ton of client work, yet here's a signature presentation, which is more about hypnotic language hacks, the linguistics around ethical influence, which there then is a moment where there's just one demo and getting the impact from that one demo because I'm not there for the entertainment factor. Yeah. So flipping that model, yet back when it was the full on stage days, we all had all sorts of remote control music systems at the time. <laughs> um, honestly, I would set myself up for this Russian roulette scenario of, I don't know what track's going to play next. Let's figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden, here came stuff that eventually worked its way into the program. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's 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 something that fascinates me. And it, like you said, there was always this kind of divide between, like, you've got hypnotherapy on one hand, stage hypnosis on the other, doing silly things, barking at people, comedy, and, and very permissive, plinky-plonky music, woo-woo stuff in the therapy thing. I, I, I think it's so oh, yeah, important. I forgot to turn my music on for my sessions. Today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's so important for the hypnotherapy community to take on board some of the stage hypnosis stuff, especially well, here in the UK. Let me, let me be a little direct on this, and I won't call out names. Mm -hmm. um, yet, let's talk business for a moment. Uh, in Russell Brunson, the guy who founded ClickFunnels and has some really great books, yeah. I think it's in his book, Expert Secrets there's this one little paragraph about who your audience could be that you're speaking to. And they could easily fit into three categories. And this is a massive generalization. Uh, here are the diehards who love what they're already doing and don't want to change it. Yeah. Here are the people who are satisfied. It's not enough of a pain point and maybe they could be swayed. Uh, but then here's the people who are frustrated. The more you can do in your messaging to focus on that frustrated audience because those are the people that are already ready to change. Mm -hmm. It's like we had in our hypnotic workers community, someone posted something about, someone put up this post that she wouldn't trust a hypnotist that wasn't also a doctor. I'm like, well, let me just ask you a question though. Is that person actually looking for this service and considering it to become a client? No, then they're not your client. There's enough people out there who want what we do. Yeah. Focus on them. Yeah. So, you know, smartphones for a moment. Uh, there's the diehards who have already decided they want the iPhone 15. They haven't yet released the iPhone 14, but there's people out there who are going to buy it no matter what. You're not going to bring those people to Android. Here are the satisfied. I It's okay enough. I know there's other stuff the devices do better. Um, it'd be more of a pain point to have the switch unless I had a decent reason uh, versus I hate this thing. It won't make calls. So <laughs> frustrated. So I bring this up because somehow I brought Richard Nongard on board uh, to co-train my Work Smart Hypnosis Live event because we don't agree on everything. Mm -hmm. And that helps the students get more of a well-rounded approach and different yeah. styles and flexibility. And the category that turns out there's a lot of frustrated hypnotists out there. Yeah. So we, we, we were shocked that we had to change our communication around it to the public because half the group will be people who are brand new and it's the first thing they're doing. And the other half on paper may have significant uh, experience, yet they're not getting consistent results. They're not getting the desired outcomes of this. 
So um, that was a sidebar, and I had a perfect reason why I told the story as to uh, frustrated, satisfied, <laughs> and so forth. What did you just say? <laughs> I've been in front of a camera and lights all day. <laughs> um, we're talking about uh, the importance of hypnotherapists taking on board. Oh, yeah, yeah. So on. buckle up. Uh, <laughs> I get the feedback, and I'm always looking to enhance what someone has done before. Yeah. So I don't want them signing up for our event going, I took this training. It was crap. I go, well, hang on. Because there's a way that we teach it that shows you the formulas beneath the process, which make it so you can then go back to what you learned and see it in a different angle. Um, I teach the Dave Elman induction as the first induction that I teach, not just because it's good, but because it teaches the practitioner to think in terms of process as opposed to my first stage hypnosis book I read. Memorize these words. That ought to work. Yeah. That's crap yeah. so the scenario is i keep getting this feedback well i learned from this person and they said stage hypnosis is the worst thing in the world really i learned from this person and they said stage hypnosis makes it harder for us let's call it out more people every month are looking on the web for a hypnotist who does hypnosis yeah. than they are looking for a hypnotherapist who does hypnotherapy yes uh, people awesome. vote with their clicks. People vote with their searches. Bow down to the gods of Google and use their words. I bring this up because I have to just say it. The Anyone who's clinging to the concept of hypnotherapy because they don't want to be confused with those stage folk um, doesn't appreciate the history of their own profession. Yeah. And the I story think... is full respect to Erickson, but some of Erickson's students were people who were in medical environments who couldn't do the length of what he would teach. And it was, if I remember the history exactly right, a podiatrist and a dentist sitting in the audience of Mr. Dave Elman. Yeah. We just saw you hypnotize 20 people in 90 seconds. Sometimes we only have 10 minutes in the room with the patient. Can you teach us medical hypnosis? He rightfully responds. I don't know what that is. They go, we know, but we can explain the scenarios and it's where the reason why um, the book came later in Elman's life was that his Dave Elman medical hypnosis course was more of a collaborative process. Mm. He would share something. The doctors would go off and workshop it and then come back. And the insult that Erickson would land of the lay hypnotist and many others use that over the years as well. Um, I've had enough events where I was the one in the room, quote, not qualified to do it. Yet teaching, here was the psychologist, here was the psychiatrist. So, and here's the brief history where hypnosis disappeared mm. for a while. Um, here was Esdale on the trip to demonstrate to the British doctors his methods. And in that time, they kind of figured out chloroform and other anesthesias better. And they wouldn't let him do the demos without the stuff. Yeah. So it was a time where hypnosis disappeared and it was the stage hypnotist who kept it alive. Yeah. So there's no, there's honestly, there's not one single bit of value of going, that's not good. Well, um, weirdly, I also think there's an importance for stage. Get off the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there's, I think there's an importance for stage hypnotists to learn from some of the hypnotherapy community as well. Because like we, we touched on earlier, stage hypnosis, they, they, they learn it, they kind of master it and they stop there. Whereas mm -hmm. hypnotherapists are always, they're always developing, they're always after a new technique, a new this, a new that, a new the other. They're always trying to, they understand more than an entertainment side of things about the importance of marketing, advertising, you know, the, the business side of things. So I think stage hypnotists can learn from those as well. Well, uh, I think, I think too, stage hypnotist. And this is part of what drew me to hypnosis. My side effect of learning all this years ago was a greater intention of language, a greater specificity of communication, which came about because if all this stuff is based upon effective communication, why does it need to be a thing we only do when we're doing the process? If this is effective communication, let's just do it all the time. Mm. And it's never that a technique didn't work. It's never that the routine didn't work. It's instead what ways can I phrase this better yeah. to get a more consistent outcome Every or time, even oh, to reverse engineer a situation and go, how do I let the spontaneous thing happen every single time? So here, here's two examples of this. 
there's a moment where in some sort of emotional change with a client, I'll ask, scan your body, where do you feel that the strongest? And then we go through a longer process, which is about crafting together resources, building an empowered anchor, and all the line is, and as you focus on this new feeling, where do you notice this new feeling now? And every single time without prompting it, they put it in the place where the old thing used to be, which means mm -hmm. I get to claim a hit and say, isn't that fascinating how you're able to instantly and automatically overwrite that old pattern? As this new feeling is here, check this out. As you focus on this feeling of confidence, try to bring back that old fear. Just notice it goes further away. Yeah. Really try to bring back, which there's some tonality to this. I'm emphasizing the result I want and de-emphasizing the result I don't want. Yeah. So <laughs> go ahead and try to separate those hands. Try to say, like, how's that going to play out? Yeah. Um, and in stage hypnosis, here's the time. I was doing the it's really cold. Grab a hold of the person next to you. Uh, that'll keep you nice and warm. That person's a personal body heater just for you. And I'm only five foot four. I'm small. And the big guy on the end grabs me. And I completely lose my composure for like two minutes, laughing my ass off and joining the audience in the fun. And finally, it's the, okay, hands back in your laps, hands back in your own. And Grant, wouldn't you believe the luck? As I did that routine probably another seven, 800,000 times, it always happened every yeah. single program. Yeah. How? I made sure that I put the biggest guy up there on the end. And at the end of it, um, grab a hold of the person next to you. I'd be walking behind the rows to then go. And the person on the other side is even warmer. And um, I'm not a sports person, but it was a hockey hip check. <laughs> <laughs> As I walked behind the row, I just nudged that person, which yeah. told him through eyes closed that, oh, I can feel that. There's another person over there. And again, how do we do this? We reverse engineer. Yeah. So let's... Can I, can I teach hypnosis in two minutes? <laughs> Go on. Okay. So <laughs> I already saw a couple of comments here and I'll leave them out of this because there's enough of them. Oh, is that this technique? Oh, is it that technique? All we're doing are variations upon a theme. Yeah. And let me tell you the end first. The thing I'm about to share with you, we had someone take a training that he took the class and brought his family along too, which is kind of cool. Uh, and the line was, you somehow improved everything I knew about hypnosis and ruined everything I knew about hypnosis in the opening five minutes. Brilliant. Thanks. It's like, because every method, you know, induction, deepener, stage hypnosis, uh, hypnotherapy, every technique you would put up on a pedestal and say, this is the thing to use. It all comes back to cause and effect relationships. As you do this, this thing happens. Yeah. Cause effect pacing, leading, they're all in the same category. So as you open your eyes and as you look at that arm, pace, pace, here comes the lead, it gets even stronger. When you open up your eyes and see everyone else walking out to the crowd, you're going to realize, here comes the suggestion, your body is stuck to the chair. Even if it is emotional change, as you focus on that feeling, pace, you can follow it back to the first time you felt that way, lead. Yeah. So we get caught up with this this shiny object syndrome of, oh, it's this technique, it's that technique, mm -hmm. the core foundation, it's all the same formulas yep. time and time again. And that's what the stage hypnotist can get from either going through, you know, I do an influence training or even a hypnotherapy training as to, well, what actually makes this work? That's why I yep. moved from stage to learning the clinical. It's like, okay, they're hypnotized, but I don't know why I'm keeping this many and not the others. Yeah. And by learning how to address 20 people as if they were 20 individuals, that's where it, it wasn't to say I'm the almighty one and I can do this better. No, I end up keeping most, if not all of the volunteers because I wasn't going the numbers game of one strategy for everybody. In my yeah. head, I had 20 individuals. Yeah. And do you know, that's so important to treat them as individuals. A lot of stage courses do that whole numbers game. You're going to get 20% of the room that volunteer. You're going to get a certain percentage of those people go under. Treating them as individuals, they'll pick up on that. And it just helps the process so much more. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Natasha says, is that kinetic shift? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> that's, uh, 
I love that process. That's uh, yeah. Carl Smith. Yeah. Um, you've already hinted we can become colorful on this. Uh, I love Carl. His community, though, started to do a funny thing around it a while ago, which was, uh, what was the line? Um, oh, what do you do with that issue? Oh, you just cast the shit out of that thing. <laughs> I'm like, I really wanted to take that and turn it into a meme. Like you're, you know, Sheila Granger with a virtual gastric band. You just VGB that mofo, right? <laughs> you just progressive muscle relaxation, that thing to hell. It's like, just, I loved how it created a subculture, yeah. which again, as you focus on that feeling here, I've grabbed it, I've pulled it, I love it, yet again, at the core of it, it's cause and effect and complex equivalence relationships. Yeah. Understand, understand why the technique is working, and that means you can troubleshoot it. The same way that, um, have you had Terry Stokes on here before? Yes. Yeah, Terry gives a great lecture on understand why the thing is actually funny. Yeah, yes. You know, when you understand the how and the why beneath it, you know how to customize it for whatever situation as opposed to i hear these absolutes as to that technique doesn't work for quitting smoking oh don't use that method for weight loss oh that technique's not good it's like no the technique's only what, what side note when you hear that dialogue buckle up they're about to sell you something yeah. uh, but yeah. really this absolutist thing um Cults are better organized, Natasha, than most of the hypnotic professions. So we can't call it a cult. We've learned that. I think. I think. Uh, <laughs> I'm not generalizing too much here, but there is uh, because of the business of hypnosis. Uh, there is there is people that do position themselves um, as, uh, I suppose, thought leaders or cult leaders within that community, uh, and people kind of. Do and I think especially in the stage world, they do become members of that camp. You know, I trained with this person, so this person is shit. And it's like, well, no, you can learn from you can learn from everybody. Just because you've learned that technique from this person doesn't mean that that technique from that other person is faulty. Um, and we're, we're in a profession that doesn't have an international celebrity. I mean, yeah. in terms of the general public, yeah. you know, or at least where you are, Paul but McKenna, Paul McKenna, a household name, but yeah. His stuff, I love it. Didn't really pick up the same momentum over here. So really, there isn't someone calling it hypnosis. Yeah. That cuts out Tony Robbins. There isn't someone calling it hypnosis that we have a household name towards. So there's more than enough business to go around. And I'll poke fun of myself with this one. I the, the, When we hung out in uh, Vegas a couple of years ago, right after that, Sean Michael Andrews and I taught a class together. And... There was someone who, from my office that used to be in Springfield, Virginia, you could see her house from my front door of my office, but she took it in Vegas because the dates were better and I've never been there. So why not? Um, so as luck would have it, she flew back on the same flight and she's there going, no one's bothering you. <laughs> what do you mean? She goes, you're famous. Big fish, small pond. Don't know. And you know, I have students, and you know, thank you for this. But students will sometimes go, "I'm going to put on my website that I train with you." I'm like, I, I appreciate that. Yet your clients don't care. Yeah. yeah. You know, in business, what are we always doing? Here's the sales lesson: we're always helping to shift people's criteria that they're making decisions based upon, and we're helping to elevate their knowledge to make the best decision for themselves. Yeah. There's every sales strategy that's out there. How many sessions? How much? Well, you know, we begin with a quick conversation to see if this is a match for you because, well, respectfully, I don't want to ask you to buy a program if I don't know I can help you. So the way that this obviously works is we'll spend some time talking about your goals. I'll spend some time explaining exactly what I do and how it works. And then if I'm confident that I can help you out, I'll explain how we can get started. Yeah. Makes sense. Which by the way, that was a three act structure. We'll talk about your goals. We'll talk about how this works. And then here's the intermission. If I'm confident that I can help you out, I'll explain how we can get started. Mm -hmm. Sound good. Anyone out there who's ever been hesitant around sales, you have now just been given the uh, checkered go flag that it's okay to make that offer at the end of the call. Yeah. So <laughs> sales 101, inoculate objections before they arise get permission to make the sales offer even before you make the offer. Yeah. And it's, it's, 
Sales is such an important part of what we do as therapists, as hypnotists, as stage hypnotists, as entertainers, because if I don't do my job right selling my show, then the client is going to get probably the wrong hypnotist that's going to do the wrong show, which is going to cause them harm, whether it be because they get a boring show and people no longer buy tickets. So I've got to sell my show the right way. And I will- Can I edit the word them. sell? You've got to educate and inform them to make the right decisions. Yes. That it's not about fast. I mean, the stage hypnosis career that I ran, and uh, we eventually just handed this off to someone else just because I'm like, I have moved. I don't need to be booking other people's programs anymore. And what the whole premise was is I never sold the first show. Hmm. I wasn't selling a show. I was selling the tradition of having this back every year at your school. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> the favorite moment was often, and I did kind of dip into this nothing to lose mindset at one point as to the administrator would bring me into the office and sit me down. It's like, you need to understand this needs to be an appropriate school for, school for a show for our students. Like, oh, cool. Hang on a second. Um, here's this five page document. It's size 10 point font. Uh, these are the 500 schools I've worked at. And do you see some of them have multiple asterisks next to it? Yep. Uh, those are the schools, those denote the ones that I've gone back to multiple years. Um, so we need to go finish setting up. But can I just ask a favor? If I do anything that offends you or is not appropriate for your school, can you like message all those schools and tell them never to hire me again? Because I don't have that resume unless I've done exactly what you're asking to do. Yeah. Um, you mind if I go finish setting up? And it was polite. It was respectful. But it was the, I got this yeah. kind of attitude. And I think that's what we've, we've got to instill that confidence in the client. If mm -hmm. we're hesitant, if we're unsure, if we're nervous about the sale, um, if we're nervous about the money, then that, that intention goes to the client and it makes them nervous about it as well. So yeah. The solution to that is, again, quality of the process is directly proportionate to the quality of the journey getting there. Mm -hmm. So this is where it doesn't have to be, wait for the phone call and hope we can book it. This is how if we bring the right intention to our marketing, as much as I teach a high level sales process, let's build the world where, uh, is he here? <laughs> I say, uh, Michael DeShallot has the best sales closing line in the world. All right, so what do you want to do? <laughs> so build the place of the proof, build the place of the credibility. Uh, I'll tell you the, the little quote that I shared earlier, the three-act structure. Hmm. We'll talk about your goals. I'll explain how this works. And if I'm confident I can help you out, I'll explain how we can get started. Um, not to throw numbers at this for bragging rights, but she did buy into at the time a $2,400 program, roughly 1800 British pounds. And she goes, I called around and I knew from the first 10 seconds that I was going to work with you. Yeah. Because everyone else just didn't have a process. And you made me feel comfortable in those first few moments that just this guy gets it. Yeah. Hey, here's how we're going to do this today. So set the foundation, follow through. So, yeah, Natasha says, I had a guy try to use a cold sales technique last night. Uh, she played along for three questions, then called him out on it. Uh, he has links to different hypnosis groups. <laughs> Fresh art certification with someone who has absolutely no business teaching it. Or, well, there's a, there's a lot of people in this industry that, that are like that. Well, again, scriptatist rather than the hypnotist. It comes around mm -hmm. to calibration. Um, again, this is not for bragging rights. I had a person on the phone a while ago who like squints in and he goes, you know, it's only showing one of these in this uh, two headed view here. He squints in and he looks at these movie posters that my camera makes me cinematic and crisp, makes the background a little distorted. And he leans in and he goes, Oh, there you go. Um, that's space balls. And that's the musical of the movie man. Of the music <laughs> man. And I just saw the opening to go, the program is usually 4,000, but if you want some coaching sessions along with it, we'll call it 6,000. He goes, let me get my credit card. And I go, cool. So we can use this time to go ahead and onboard and get you set up then. Brilliant. But just he nerded out over the same things that I will get into. I knew he had been following my live streams that I do yeah. in our communities and just the rapport was there. You mentioned clients and I do need to let you know, I have a client waiting on me in about uh, two yes. months. Yes. <laughs> we have, we have um, 
Before we go, before I let you go, um, one golden nugget, one tip for someone wanting to book more clients, uh, do better shows, one golden nugget, what would it be? Stop selling hypnosis. Stop selling results. Definitely stop selling world's funniest and start <laughs> selling the next step. Yeah. Everything you do, all communication is selling the next step. So like I said, I teach the Dave Elman induction first in the training before going on to other methods because it teaches you to think in terms of process. An email, the subject line of the email sells the next step as to whether or not you open it. The first sentence of the email sells the next step as to whether or not they keep reading. If there's an image that you want them to click, the image itself sells them onto whether or not they click. So I'll pair this together with something on the hypnosis side of things in terms of client work. Do you see why it's a conflict to have on your website? Call this number to book your appointment. They're probably not yet qualified to yeah. make that decision. So it may be different for you. I tend to use an application process, uh, which you've dropped the link here a couple of times, uh, yeah, worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash velvet. Um, it's the training that shows my next step process, which this should produce a cringe of fear in some people. We had a good problem years ago. We were getting upwards of 60, 70 new calls a week. But as you'd imagine, not everybody was in a state of readiness. Not everybody was a qualified client. Some were just curious. So by changing the entry point on the website, it became click here to schedule your consultation. Click here to schedule your strategy session. Yeah. And it asked a number of questions. And the benefit became the people who are willing to answer those questions were metaphorically raising their hand and saying, I'm ready for this. Yeah. So we went from closing maybe five to eight of those 60 to nearly every single one. So it's again, sell the next step. You could take what I said. I'm, I, I tend to not do direct sales. I tend to more do, let's share the value. You know where to find me, worksmarthypnosis.com. Here's our Facebook groups. But that is a link to something that's 27 bucks and it just shows you the step-by-step -step of how to do it. So um, kids were having supper tonight. <laughs> but again it's going to show you the next step thinking that let's break it down and like hurdles like building a house you're only moving to the next step when it's the right time to do so Brilliant. and we can take that same thinking into our sessions into our shows it's the same philosophy uh you asked for one nugget here's two stop segmenting all communication is hypnotic all conversations are hypnotic all problems are hypnotic. All changes are hypnotic. So stop thinking about doing hypnosis with your client and start teaching them to become hypnotic. Fantastic. Jason, it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I've never nodded my head so much uh, in one of these live streams. <laughs> uh, and there was some absolute real real kind of actionable nuggets of information there that hopefully the guys watching will take on board. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, and guys, do click. I'll put that link up one more time as well. Do click on that link um, and, and get that kind of sorted. Uh, Jason, I shall let you get off to your clients. Thank you very much for, for doing this, for sharing your, your expertise with the class. Uh, and guys, please uh, check out Jason's socials, check out his YouTube, his Facebook groups, and most importantly, check out Work Smart Hypnosis. Guys, that's it from me. Uh, and goodbye from Jason as well. Thank you very All much. Right. See ya. Thanks See again. Later.